So we're at Saunders Field. Uh, Saunders Field is one of the most famous parts of the Battle of the Wilderness. It's where a lot of the fighting takes place on the first day of the battle, at least here on the northern side of the battlefield. It's the first place where the Union troops even realize that they're about to end up in a fight at all as they see Confederates streaming down the road and setting up uh, in the woods behind me. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about two regiments here today, uh, the 140th New York and the 146th New York. Um, they have a very interesting story here. Um, it, it helps, of course, that they are zouaves. Uh, they wore uh, special uniforms patterned on uh, French troops. Um, at this time, French, uh, the French army was considered the army to, to emulate, to copy uh, throughout much of the world. And that's, in a sense, what these soldiers were trying to do. They were trying to copy the uniforms and the prestige of these uh, rather famous uh, French units. Uh, now, as we move down into the field itself and out of this little grove of trees, uh, we're going to break into the area that the 140th and 146th New York are going to cross over. Now, the U.S. troops are to the east in the wood line behind you, uh, and we're moving towards the Confederates now. Once it becomes obvious that a, a, an engagement is coming, that the, the decision by the U U.S. High Command has been made that we are going to fight here, that wasn't the original plan. They're trying to get south of Lee, get in between Lee and Richmond, uh, but Lee will intercept them here, first here at Saunders Field. Grant and Meade decide that instead of uh, attempting to move through the wilderness, they're going to fight the Confederates here. So they order the Union Fifth Corps, commanded by a guy named Governor K. Warren, to turn his corps around, get him faced west, and pitch into the Confederates as soon as they can. Now, it's going to take a couple of hours. Um, Warren is commanding uh, tens of thousands of men. This is, uh, as, as simple as it may seem, getting 10,000 guys to all, face, uh, to all face in the same direction in the same line isn't the easiest thing in the world, especially in terrain like this. Once they are organized, however, one of the first units to go forward is going to be the 140th New York of uh, Ayer's Brigade of Griffin's Division of the U.S. 5th Corps. Now, as we're leaving the, the tree line, you're, we're entering the Saunders Field proper. You can see how open and exposed this area is. The Confederates are in trenches behind me in the wood line. And you've got a bunch of guys in bright blue uniforms standing out in nice big lines in an open field. Now, ironically, they're actually better off in some ways than the guys in the woods, because at least the guys here can see what they're doing. In the woods to my north and to my south are more U.S. troops that are basically blind, fumbling through this terrain. And what that's going to mean is that their lines are going to break apart. As the New Yorkers move forward, they lose contact with the men to their north and south. They hit this area right that I'm in right now. This is called the Swale. This is a diagonal cut that traverses the length of Saunders Field. And if you almost think of these Union troops like a flow of water, just like water, they're going to collect in this depression because they're actually a little bit safe here. The Confederates on top of the ridge can't actually shoot at them down here. So they're going to stop. They're going to take a couple seconds. They're going to reform their lines. But they're going to end up diagonal to the position they're trying to go because they're forming up in this swale. So when they move forward, not only are they alone, they're off kilter. So they're going to move up this slope, angled south, actually moving slightly towards the road, uh, which of course at the time would not have been paved um, and would not have had anywhere near as much traffic on it. But what that means is that they're not hitting the Confederates square on, which makes it easier for the Confederates to break up their attack. Now, despite that, the uh, New Yorkers are going to do an awfully good job. They're going to get up this hill. And the minute they're going to, you're going to see the trenches, they're going to walk basically face first into. 
So we're now almost on top of the ridge line that the Confederates had set up on, but there are no trenches here. Now, you might assume that this would be the best place to set up your trenches. You're on the height of the hill, right? That's what normally you would do, but that's not what the Confederates did. You see, these Confederates, the uh, Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, led by Richard Ewell, were actually not trying to bring on a major engagement at this point. They're just trying to slow the Union down long enough that the rest of the Army can catch up. So what they actually did was instead of building their trenches here on the top, on the crest or the military crest of the hill, they actually built them on what's called the reverse slope. So just ever so slightly on the other side of the top of the hill from the Union forces. Now that did a couple of things for them. One, it concealed their numbers. Two, it concealed how long their lines were. And three, as those New Yorkers crest the hill, just as we're doing now, they're gonna walk face first into concealed trenches and Confederate musket fire. The, uh, the collision of these two forces was tremendous. Uh, so much so, in fact, that uh, part of the reason why was because the Confederate troops here don't actually just wait in their trenches, which are just behind me here. They actually jump out of them and counter charge right at the moment of impact. Now, as this happens, as these New Yorkers are moving in, the U.S. regulars that are supposed to be to their north have been diverted. They've lost contact with the regulars. They've lost contact with the Michigan troops to their south. They are out here alone, fighting in these dense, thick woods, which would have been even denser at the time. To try and relieve the 140th, they're going to send forward the 146th New York. They're also going to come in here. They're going to try and form to the 140th's right. But the rest of the attack continues to fall apart. About an hour after the attack is launched, the U.S. troops begin to retreat, falling back across the field. It's just one problem. Nobody told the New Yorkers. So you end up with two regiments of New York troops stuck out here, surrounded on three and sometimes all four sides by Confederate troops completely isolated from the rest of the U.S. Army. Soldiers talk of this being a fight of invisibles against invisibles, of men disappearing into the woods, melting away, never to be seen or heard from again. The trenches occupied by the Confederate troops catch fire, fire that will spread rearward into the field itself. This was truly some of the most hellish fighting the Civil War had seen up to this point. The wilderness will in fact become famous or infamous for its fires. So these New Yorkers stuck in here have no other choice but to fight their way back out. They don't have the ability to just simply retreat and go back across the field. They're stuck and have to bushwhack their way back through Confederate troops. Many of them will retreat back into the field we just walked through, an area that was just as deadly to retreat through as it was to advance. Many of the New York's wounded will get stuck in that swale that we walked through. A lone spot of seeming protective uh, land that becomes a death trap as the field catches fire. Men are forced to scramble as best they can towards the road, acting as a fire break. Not all of them make it. The Both of these regiments are going to lose more than half of their number in the space of an hour. Both come in with about four or five hundred men. Both are lucky to have 250 at roll, roll call that evening. But something interesting happens with the casualty counts. 1864, here at the Wilderness, um, this is an election year. The war had already raged since 1861. Casualties at almost every major engagement had been beyond what many Americans at the time were capable of even really processing. 
And that's no less true here. By the time the Battle of the Wilderness is over, 18,000 U.S. troops have been killed, wounded, or gone missing. 12,000 Confederates. But Warren, commander of the U.S. Fifth Corps, doesn't like how those numbers end up coming out. So he's going to end up uh, cooking the books a little bit. In fact, we're actually going to talk about that at the marker for the 140th New York back down in Saunders Field. So we're now standing here at the monument to the 140th New York here at Saunders Field at the Battle of the Wilderness. Now, if you look at the numbers, 23 killed, 118 wounded, 114 missing. That is 200. And 55 casualties. It's more than half the regiment. Unfortunately, these numbers are inaccurate, but they're the best numbers we have. I mentioned that Warren cooks the books. Well, after the actions here at Saunders Field, he is overheard by one of his aides saying that this will, these numbers will not do. So Warren, to soften the blow, here at Wilderness, has some of the uh, killed category conveniently misplaced in the missing. Now, although having a loved one go missing certainly is not good, is, not, is, not, is, is going to do damage to those living back home, it is far better than to hear they have been killed. And unfortunately, this is something of a, of a political move. The hope is that by sliding these men from the killed to the missing section of the book, uh, people will be less distraught over the carnage wrought here. Uh, I mentioned 18,000 U.S. casualties, killed, wounded, and missing here. That's more than the entire U.S. force present at the Siege of Yorktown at any battle in the Mexican-American War, just the casualties. Like I said, 1864 is an election year. The fear is that if the home front just continues to receive this kind of bad news again and again, it'll damage Lincoln's chances of re-election. His opponent, George B. McClellan in the Democratic Party, is running on a peace platform. Although McClellan openly opposed ending the war with the South winning, he was also against abolition, but the Democratic platform called for the immediate secession of all hostilities which basically would have ended the war with the Southern victory. So Warren cooks the books. And we have no way of knowing how many men that should have been in the killed column ended up getting slid into the missing column. Now, to be sure, there were plenty of legitimately missing men. Not necessarily because they couldn't find the bodies, but because they couldn't be identified. Men are burned so terribly by the fires here that there's no way of knowing which side they fought for, let alone what unit they belonged to or even who they were. Unfortunately, horrors like this will become all too common here in Virginia over the next year as the ferocity of the Civil War only ratchets up. But perhaps it was necessary to bring the war to some kind of conclusion at all.